I am pleased to introduce the next panel. Um, Julia Madeska has been incredibly supportive of Tectalia. Same thing with Francesca Versace. I want to thank you both. We actually have something special for you after the panel, so please make sure to come and find me. It wouldn't have been possible to do Tectalia without them this year. In fact, all three venues tomorrow, we have breakfast before the Last Supper, were you know, helpfully arranged by Julia and Francesca. Thank you so much. So Achi Milano, Pastaceria San Carlo, and of course tonight, our incredible Palazzo Trivuzio. Uh, Jeez, I need to practice my Italian, or at least I'm exhausted. Um, this panel actually also has another very close friend of mine on it. Um, we went to college together, and she is um, in incredible. Um, she's had uh, roles in public companies as well as now at Lego. So it's amazing to see her journey as well as mine. We actually have another Babson student here, and so it's pretty pretty cool experience. But let's get it going. And uh, Simona, I met just recently, but my favorite T-shirt uh, and actually a couple of shirts are from Espici. So thank you. Thank you. Um, but let's get it going. Let's get the panel going. We've got to stop talking. Hello, hello. Hand it over to Julia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Gabriel, for the opportunity to be here and interviews these amazing ladies. So I would like to start with Simona. Tell us a little about your career in the fashion world and how this has resulted in your living in Paris, the Netherlands, and now back in Italy. Oh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's the life. I should describe... Uh, uh, years of, uh, of, of work and career, but mainly I, I, lived, I left Milano in 2005, going to work in LVMH in Paris, and uh, it was great. It was an unbelievable experience as a woman to, to be part of LVMH, and uh, then Netherlands came after six years, I was in Paris. Uh, I went to work for private equity, and uh, I've been there five years. And as a woman, I don't know, I felt mm, just normal. You work hard, you achieve results, and you get to the next level. I didn't particularly feel I was um, um, not able to do a step because I was a woman. I thought it was pretty smooth. Everything happened in, in a nice and smooth and good way. Um, I would say I faced uh, the fact I was a woman. I realized I was a woman when I tried to go back to my country. And there is where I realized I was just a woman. <laughs> the, the manager disappeared. No, it's true. Only it's I realized like... it uh, when I tried to come back. I have a daughter. I really wanted her to be Italian, not the daughter of an Italian immigrant growing in the Netherlands and telling to the, the friends, yes, my mom is Italian, but... You know, I'm not, you know? So I said, this is the country of culture. This is the country I'm born and raised. I wanted her to be Italian. She had to get that part. And uh, I decided to go back, and it took me more than a year and a half to, to come back. Why? Because it's very hard for a woman to, to be considered a manager or for an Italian company to need a manager. So it's both. It's not only women, maybe even <coughs> managers have tough life here, because the majority of the fashion companies are born from creativity, and maybe that is the head of the company, which is probably a family. Hence, why they would need a manager, and then a manager that is a woman. So that really came as a surprise to me. I didn't consider that, actually. And uh, after a year and a half, I, I found my way. I worked for private equity. The private equity bought this amazing, beautiful brand called Aspesi. Aspesi needed, a, let's say, more um, a turnaround in terms of uh, positioning uh, uh, equity of the brand rather than financial, because it was a very solid company that always did very well for 40 years, probably too much liabilities because it was 100% an Italian brand only. So we had to work on a few things. But um, yeah, I, I, I found my way in a private equity rather than in an Italian firm that uh, stands for other criteria. So that's, that's how it worked. 
And Francesca, you're coming also from a fashion board and you changed completely your career like a year and a half ago and now you are in Web3. So why and what's, what's your role there? Um, so I was uh, surrounded always by creative people and uh, inspired by fashion, of course. It was part of my family and um, I was a freelance designer um, a lot of years and uh, uh, being in the fashion industry and uh, I had also my labels of uh, Fev Bags which was going very well and, um, and then suddenly um, I found myself like, oh, what, what am I going to do next? So I was kind of a bit lost and confused and then suddenly uh, being, uh, I was able for being a freelance designer, I was able to travel a lot, uh, you know, collecting art and uh, soaking up different cultures. And uh, I was always had some passion for creativity and uh, and also music. So, following my instinct of research and um, and the inspiration that led me to create with founders, you, Julia. Sergio and Alfredo, who is in London, uh, our uh, NFT music platform. Um, so basically, it's, it's really fun now, it's really creative. I deal with a lot of people from uh, different sectors and uh, I see uh, the NFT projects being as an opportunity um, and uh, it's, it's a bridge between different industry working together. So I feel very creative at the moment. And, uh, and also I learn every day about technology because also I think, um, you know, blockchain technology gives uh, a way to the artist to, to, to build music with, with visuals. And that's exactly what we're doing with public pressure. So uh, I didn't stop being creative and uh, I, I also, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by also uh, more tech, uh, more people that have uh, uh, a bigger knowledge of, uh, of course, blockchain, and I'm surrounded by them, like Sergio, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, it's fun, and I'm learning every day. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's it's a fun project, and I'm really enjoying it. So when you have passion for something, you go and you never stop. <laughs> and so, Lauren. <laughs> As a child, uh, growing up in America, you were exposed to a lot of thirds. First female judge, first women Supreme Court, first women to win the Nobel P Prize and Bio Biochemistry Award. Did this have, a, have an impact on, on you in your life? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and definitely. So not only did I look up to role models that I saw when I was a little girl in the States, but I think also I set out to make my own firsts. Right, so I didn't see it as other people setting firsts and kind of me following in the footsteps. So two of those firsts, which might be interesting or notable, um, I come from a no passport family, which in America is very, very common. So about 27% of Americans have a passport in their entire life. And so I was the first one in my family to leave the state, to leave the country. Um, and since then I've lived in 16 countries, I've traveled to 75, and I've essentially not really been, lived and been back there. And so I think for me, that was really transformational in my career as well. The second one was there's a lot of ageism and kind of age bias about how you move through corporate society. And for me, working in banking, working in technology, working in travel, um, I was able to be one of the youngest women to join a FTSE, so a British listed, uh, publicly listed company at the age of 30 in the executive team. Um, and now I'm in a family-owned business with the Lego group. But I think just really thinking about um, oftentimes, you know, you are the leader you're waiting for. And so, yes, role models are incredibly important, but we are the role models, right, for the next generation. And so what are we doing? Um, and, you know, many women here have inspired me uh, with their stories as well. And Simona, Forbes 2018 listed you amongst the 100 winning Italian women that have disting distinguished themselves. Did, did this year, this is alter your career journey in the fashion industry in any way? Well, uh, that is the consolidation of something you have done before, probably. So Forbes came as, a, of course, an incre incredible emotion. This is like when you win a prize for something that uh, you have done. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's important what I achieved, but it's more important how then you transfer this to other women. So being the first, possibly, 
but uh, let's make sure that other will join that club. For me, it's even more important than what I did. I think if I inspire uh, a woman in Italy or I can be a model for any girl, I achieved uh, much more than what I thought I would have achieved in my life. And um, the, the thing is, uh, our mentality is not even prepared to think that that is possible, I think, in Italy. So for me, that, that price is uh, something you can show and explain that if you really work hard and you have a kind of a dream, maybe you can succeed with, with that. But uh, here also the culture is, uh, what do you study? Look, this is the tech industry. You know, I don't think a lot of women or girls in Italy are thinking they could be a tech. Uh, mastermind, even my daughter or yours, Julia. <laughs> so basically, for me, it's uh, uh, it changed. No, maybe helps to consolidate and to portray that uh, that message to the new generation about you can even be recognized if you go uh, and you are at an international level. That uh, that helped. I don't think really helped my career after that. You know, yeah, it's, sure. it's something that you're proud to have, mm. but. Uh, that's very much as a price. You put it on a <laughs> furniture, you look at it. But it's what you inspire with that, and now you can uh, trans uh, nourish the, the new generation with that. I think that counts the most. No, and as you said, in technology and Web3, there are not enough women, right, Francesca? And what's, a, yeah, what's so your input when, um, from that? We had like a, a very, um, well, a, a good example of that, of that is that when we went to Berlin for the blockchain festival in September to present our project and uh, we did a preview of some NFTs and basically uh, attending the event, there were basically only men, like there were like six, seven, eight women in total. But in that, uh, in that event, we met like uh, one of the founders of Women Crypto. So we have this amazing group now, Julia and I, and uh, we are dealing, uh, we are speaking with uh, this Women in Crypto. It's like 400 uh, of us and we are exchanging ideas. And uh, so it's about supporting each other and empowering each other. And uh, also it's, it's important to transmit this to our kids, you know, from what they learn in class. You know, uh, us in Europe, we have a good potential, but in compared to, to Asian Europe, we are a bit, uh, um, Asian America, we are a bit behind because, you know, the mathematics is the basic for, for a good knowledge. If you know good mathematics, you can, you know, speak languages, Latin, you know, myself, I, I did the German school and we had like eight hours of mathematics, uh, biology, chemics. Okay, I'm not a genius in maths, <laughs> I can say, but uh, that gave me a good basis to learn languages and uh, to be open-minded to uh, a tech business, which I'm into it at the moment. So it's, uh, really, uh, it's, it's really about giving a voice to possibly a CEO, uh, a, CEO uh, a girl a CEO, or like a, a representative that's a woman in an in a, in a industry, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, the men also in finance, they're, they're a good example, like more and more women arrive in finance, so now in technology, it's, it's a good for diversity and equality to be all together, because men are, are more advanced in a way in certain part, but women also in others. So we have to create a community in order to grow. So that's very important. The community, the, the word community nowadays, it's what makes like uh, our NFT business, growing the community, uh, being all together, women and men, and uh, that is really important to us. And Lauren, and uh, as as you just joined Lego Group, tell us about about your job and what's uh, your previous job about uh, the role that also you cover in the Lego that is about diversity. Yeah, so in, in the LEGO group, I lead diversity and inclusion, and I think a lot of people think of that as a human resources topic, right? So who works for us? How do we recruit and retain diverse talent? For us, it's actually a topic across the entire business. It's how do we deliver digital transformation in an accessible way. It's how do we think about our supply chain, and we heard about that earlier. What does supplier diversity look like in our procurement efforts? It's translating through into our brand and our marketing. 
right? We are serving all of the children in the world. That's really the goal of the Lego group, and we believe children are our role models. And so it's really thinking about how do we reach them through our product design, through our marketing, through our branding? How do we safeguard children's rights in that process? So there's actually no part of the business that doesn't have a diversity and inclusion underlay. Um, I see it a bit like the digital revolution. There was a moment in time where technology started to change business. And there were businesses like Blockbuster or Polaroid that thought, yeah, this is a phase, right? We're going to keep doing things the way we've been doing things. And you know, those businesses don't exist. And look at some of the biggest businesses in the world. Companies didn't have chief technology officers, chief digital officers. Those are new. My role is also newer, right? So you're starting to see chief diversity and inclusion officers. And I think that's because this is a seismic shift in business. This goes back to the ESG conversation. It's really how do we better represent in who works for us the kind of market that we're trying to sell into. How do we innovate for people if we don't have their voices at the table? And so this is for us, and every company I've worked in, really mission critical, right? It's kind of the buy-in to the poker game at this stage. Great, thank you. And uh, Simona, only the 3% of women are CEOs in Italy, as you said before. So what's, what do you suggest to young girls what to do to arrive where you are now, as you said before, as a role model? What do you suggest to your daughter? What to do next? What to study? What's, what's your suggestion as a CEO? You know, it's, it's what to study, I don't know. I think every, every, everyone needs to follow the path that they are naturally uh, going towards. Um, what I recommend and suggest uh, to my daughters is uh, first to be independent and um, to believe in it, because uh, everything is possible if you really believe in that, uh, in that thing. So it, it's more to in, in, um, infuse the mindset that uh, the world is changing and we have given more possibilities. So if she wants to study mathematics, there is no gender. So what I teach is that there is no gender for me and uh, she can study whatever she wants uh, and from tech to whatever discipline she might choose. And uh, I think the world is changing. Italy is particularly um, slow into, into this recognition, but I believe there is more open mind versus when I started. When I started, we were only women in fashion, but at the edges were really no way. Uh, even today, at sea level in Italy, we are very few. Uh, and also underline that uh, sea level. So the minute you need to also look at uh, bringing up into a career a woman, you simply don't have it. So today we have more and more companies that want to be listed, that uh, start to have a different thinking. But you know, there is also a different uh, approach for me to be a woman and to have feminine values. So you can also be a woman with no values towards women mm -hmm. and to have the right values toward women. This uh, comes to what we are also living today in politics. So for yes. me, uh, there is also what it means uh, to be a woman and to, to share those values uh, with the new generation that counts, not only the, what you achieve. So it, it's all, all in all. In Aspesi, we did the uh, compensation of gender gap we went through white collar, blue collar, we went through three years of hard work and today there is total equality. So these things, I think uh, it's, it's what we need to teach to the new generation, starting from that. So women and men should be exactly considered the same. And I don't feel privileged if you open the door for me, but if you consider me as the same as you in two opportunities. This is also the concept that needs to change into the mindset, I believe. I agree. And Francesca, what do you think about education on little girls, as, uh, as Simona said, for to get them to, uh, to, to join in technology and what you suggest to so do? So I think the biggest work comes from when you're inside your walls, you know, and of the house, you have to really push your daughter from when she's like five, six, seven to really open-minded about new skills, you know, robotics and uh, mathematics and like uh, things with the iPad and, you know, not all the creativity in paper and knitwear and so on, you know, like it really has to come from the family and also uh, be, uh, be open-minded to send them to a campus, summer camps, or to attend like where, where they melt this 
you know, when we're the together, this community, and that they grow each other. So not be on holidays for two months because you have school for two months, but really to diversify their their time and to occupy their time. In they have you have to start them young. So. Um, Italy, as I said, is a bit behind, but we are getting there. And uh, and there is a, and also with the pandemic, there was a reinforcement of the technology because you know uh, everybody suddenly was on Zoom and working on Slack. So really, the, the pandemic encouraged these uh, uh, these people where they had no idea about what how to do a Zoom call or whatsoever. So we we are we are getting there, and it's a, it's a positive. Uh, uh, time for our our generations and uh, and um, yeah so I think and Lauren what's the importance of gender diversity uh, for consumer in products and service yeah I'm gonna touch on children yeah. um, as well because I, I can't yeah, not yeah, do that yeah, <laughs> because I'm representing the Lego group but I also think we've talked a lot about girls it's equally important for boys Right, gender diversity and diversity and inclusion are, are shared accountability topics from all of us. And so we, you know, the Lego Group's done a lot of research with the Gina Davis Institute, which does a lot on gender diversity in kind of media, in entertainment, in movies. And if you look at the research and you ask children questions, and you ask them, you know, can boys do ballet and girls can play football, yes. about 80%, 70% of them will all say yes, right? Irrespective of if they're girls and boys. You go and you ask parents those questions, and parents are eight times more likely to say that their boys should be engineers and their girls should be learning to bake, right? They're six times more likely to say that their girls shouldn't be working in product management and that boys should be. So I think it's also thinking about our role, right, in our household. What stereotypes or self-limiting beliefs are we producing? Because people and children are not born with them. They learn them from society. And so I think they are our hope, as long as we can kind of keep investing in this and really supporting um, young girls and young boys. I think also, look, we asked, why is this good for business, right? I built uh, JP Morgan's first client diversity strategy, right? It was totally a free call option. It's just doing more business. Women control $72 trillion of consumer spending. It's more than India and China's combined GDP. Everyone's got a strategy for doing business in China. Everyone's got a strategy for doing business in India. Why haven't you thought about doing business with women, right? That's JP true. Morgan spent years and years just missing 50% of the population, missing markets. And when it entered, it was able to do $10 billion of net new lending to women-owned businesses to really think about narrowing the pensions gap, narrowing the investment savings gap, right? It's the right thing to do for financial literacy and for not kind of creating financial inequity, but it's also good for business. And that's true for toys, that's true for fashion, that's true for any industry. Um, you know, I assume you're not trying to narrow your market <laughs> to be fewer people. That's, that's not really commercial. Great, thank you. Anyone has any question? We have uh, five minutes left, so if there is any question from the... Please. Um, so I'm a 64-year-old white male. <laughs> of course, being gay, uh, they now count me in diversity on public boards, but I keep wondering if I'm supposed to put an H on my forehead or something. Uh, and I've witnessed on this particular board, um, the men interrupt everybody all the time. And I'm proud to say we have three women on the board out of seven, and the women don't interrupt everybody all the time, and I try to weigh in and speak for them. But I'm really in a quandary because it seems like most of the men I work with um, think this is not a problem, that they're not sexist, that they uh, treat <laughs> women the same, um, and therefore they think their company's not the problem, and it obviously is, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and it's nice to know that at least a man is accused of being strident sometimes. I mean, what do I do? How do I force, uh, you know, hit these people over the head? <laughs> Maybe Lauren, that is... <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start and then feel yeah, free to yeah. jump in and add. Um, I'm a big believer that we can't change people's minds. People will change their own minds, right? And so it's really planting seeds in a garden. It's having conversations. It's participating in kind of board-based learning about inclusion, um, about the benefits. It's giving people the tools and the information to come to that realization in their time. I think when you force people and you make things mandatory and you say, no, no, this is your problem and this is important, you will constantly get people um, feeling shame, feeling blame, feeling judgment, stepping out. And so it's, it's this exercise of, giving the tools, giving the education, giving the time to the conversation at a board level, but then letting people know that they have the autonomy, 
right, to arrive at their role um, in that conversation. It's not a very short answer to a long question, but happy to pick it up uh, offline as well. Um, for example, you know, back in the days when, um, you know, when the, my, my family's history began, like Johnny was like nine, ten years old and uh, he was gay already when he was like, you know, when he was born, I mean, like, you know, from the beginning. And my grandmother, my uh, grandfather, they, they, they captured that and they let him like being what he was. So they were really open minded back at the time. So I think that was the family blessing because maybe he, if he wouldn't be accepted as a gay, he wouldn't be, develop his creativity back by then and being a genius and then make history in fashion. So, uh, but also, you know, in another way, you know, you, you need also to have, um, to surround yourself, if it's not your family, to surround yourself by, by good people, by friends or, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter the quantity, but, but it's a matter of the quality that, you know, you, you get really positive message and you believe in yourself and, 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 and you, d you live day by day and you, you try to achieve what is the best for yourself and for your work. So, you know, that, um, that is, a, is, a, is a good example of what you were saying. Any, any more questions from the, please. Thank you, I just wanted to ask, um, what do you think is the role of schools here? I have a son and a daughter, um, and in particular I've seen how school actually probably plays a bigger role into them understanding these general concepts of diversity um, and inclusion. And also specifically I'd like to ask about Lego, because I've seen that at least in the school that I'm sending the, our kids, Lego is now part of essentially, in a way, of the curriculum. T you know, teaching them how to build, uh, how to be patient, and things like that. Um, and so, is there so is there that a long-term plan of Lego, or are they going to do more around sort of education? Um, I'll talk about Lego in a second, but I want to make some space for Simona to comment <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, I was I was thinking school plays a big role for sure because uh, we are a long way. We need to uh, walk through a very long way to, to the gender equality, to many of the themes we are discussing. School and education probably is the first pillar, and, but we need more you know, education to the teacher. We need to change the mindset of the school itself also, because today uh, the school is not prepared. So nobody could make, n no one will make it by its own. So it, it, it's a group of uh, situation and, and people that needs to work in a crazy way to really change what, what is just the beginning. We were saying where the metaverse will be in 20 years, also will be the gender gap or a thing. So we are today discussing and we are living that evolution, but school is uh, for probably the first brick for, for that evolution, the, how school will integrate, how we will uh, manage to, to be all together into that work. But I think institution plays a very big role because it starts from there also. School will not change just by itself. So there is an entire uh, group of people that needs to work from institution to school to education to, to, to walk towards uh, that path. And then I give you back the... <laughs> and completely echo that. And I think to answer you on Lego and then maybe an example from the UK, um, Lego partners with an organization called Diversity Role Models. And the, the kind of way we think about learning is learning through play. So, you know, as we heard um, here, actually giving children the tools to kind of practice creativity and collaboration and failure and taking things apart and just a different way than kind of just lecture-based. And so a lot of... The way that we have built that is with diversity role models, we've built kind of 100 workshops over the last year, kids maybe 9 to 11 in age, and we've asked them to use Lego bricks in order to really build something that articulates difference to them and kind of how they're unique and how they're different, and then to share that back to their classroom and then kind of to learn and play through that process of inclusion. So it's allowing people to kind of more freely express in education. Um, if you look at the UK, which is where I live, as one example, um, I think education works closely with the government and with charities to get this done because it's really hard for teachers. Most of what we talked about, right? We're talking about Web3, we're talking about sustainable farming. I mean, can we count on a teacher to talk to children about all of these career paths when that's not their job, really? Um, and they're not necessarily experiencing it. So I think um, in the UK, there's a great practice around role models. And there's a charity that I'm on the board of that does this, but we've taken kind of 10 million children into um, role model hours. They each have about, over time, kind of 21,000 role model hours where the, someone will just come in a classroom and say, you're learning math. Here's how I use math. 
right, in my day-to-day -day job. And you'll see four or five people that look very different in how they use math. And oh, they're not all in finance, and they're not all um, white, and they're not all heterosexual, and they're not all men. So it starts to kind of shift children's perception around what they could be, because it's really hard um, to be what you can't see. So I think we have a role to go back into schools as well and kind of role model and, and support. Um, and then the governments have to work with the schools on curriculum and representation as well. Any more questions? I think there was yeah, one. the last one. Yeah, I actually had a quick question. Um, it's, it's, yeah, so going to what Simona was saying at the beginning, um, I, I want to know if you believe that younger generation as, are becoming more open um, compared to older older generation in terms of uh, companies and companies that are started by men. I'm at 31 years old, white, uh, heterosexual, <laughs> and I'm not a minority, right? But I'm. Uh, um, I, I hired a woman in a manager managerial position from from London. She's. Uh, she's brilliant, and I believe that she can do things much better than me. And I'm the founder of the company. So, what do you think the uh, the the shift is also generational, or it's uh, it's something that is happening, or you do uh, what, what do you think? I believe we need to to work on that. It's not gonna come that easily. It's something we need to earn day by day. So it's not gonna be that easy, that granted. Nothing is granted. So in some countries, also in Europe, we have seen step forward, and in other countries, we see a big step back in rights, in many, many other steps. So I wouldn't take it as the new generation will do it. I would take it as if we work, and it's going to be hard, it's doable. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's work behind that. And we see also uh, some colleagues be this morning were talking about how, how important it is when the... Um, um, the, um, the prime minister takes decision, you know, it goes also um, into that because we can immediately change government and do 20 years back into a lot of rights. And I'm talking the general rights of everybody. So uh, we, we live in different countries, in different uh, religion, in different uh, uh, concept of what a woman is. For sure, the new generation are more open to work on into that because they hear it more. So they see it as could be natural. I, I could understand it. But then I think uh, we, we should not take it for granted. We should all work to make that possible. And I talk about not only women, I talk about gay, I talk about everything. So we should be all equal and just go and move forward for what you deliver, not for what, what we stand for. And, uh, and that is, but that is something we really need to work. I wouldn't take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.